to start talk about models and analysis of poverty traps. Um, this is going to require some understanding of dynamics, uh, dynamical systems, um, in the uh, sort of classical way we understand dynamical systems in engineering. This comes from a field uh, called quantitative development economics. Okay, but as engineers, we can look at this and understand it very easily. Um, so we're going to have dynamical models of development with a conventional view and with poverty traps. So the way this will start out is we're going to be thinking not individual level, but country level. Okay, And you know, if a country is developing economically that and, and you, you have a variable, let's say the number of dollars people make overall and then divide it by the number of people so it's a per capita measure, then you'd like that number to come up here like this, right? Nice smooth increase. Um, so that's what we mean by dynamics of development. Um, then we're going to move to a, a model of how technology affects development. In that case, you imagine something like the spread of a technology across the country, such as a phone, let's say. Some people buy it, more people, more people, more people buy it, and how does that affect development at the same time? That is, do, do technologies assist in making money? And I think you intuitively know that they do. They're, they're tools. Technologies are just tools. Um, then we're going to talk about ideas um, behind breaking poverty traps like wealth distribution policy and democracy and provisioning. And we'll talk about sustainable development. Those are the topics for this week. Okay? So we're going to get started um, on number one uh, today. Um, and then we'll move on on Wednesday and Friday to do the last uh, three bullets. Okay? So... Um, we're going to talk about the effects of technology on growth and poverty traps. To start out with, we're going to do something called a production function. So production function uh, has uh, two pieces. The little P there is just a constant, okay? And then F of C we're going to be focusing heavily on. It's, it's going to be increasing in C. In other words, if in, in C will be... Um, what's well, called the capital labor ratio. I'm going to just typically be lazy and call it capital. Think about it is as capital divided by the number of people. So that's capital labor ratio, assuming the people are working. Okay. Um, now, for this PF of C, you could have an example. It could be that PF of C is just PC of T. Do you see that the function in F of C is just C? It's just what? A line going up this way. So what that says is, is that at, if, if that represented reality, what it would say is, is that if you increase your capital a little bit, you're going to increase your return on the capital, how much money you make off your capital. For instance, if I buy a hoe to, to hoe my garden or a rake to work in my garden, I'm going to be able to make more money off of that rake or that hoe. If I have enough capital to buy a tractor, I'm going to even make more money. Okay? So F of C represents sort of a return on your capital affecting how much capital you can gain in the future. Okay? Now the P there, we're going to use to represent a proportionality factor and we're going to call it the quality of technology. So if you have a better, so it's P scale C. So if this is the line, if I get P bigger and bigger, this goes up more and more, which implies that I make more and more money for a given amount of capital. Okay, very simple. Um, we're going to investigate the effects of P here in a little bit. Okay, now capital, you might say, wait a minute, you're talking about capital, what is it? Well, you sort of think about it as money and equipments and equipment and tools per person, okay? Um, often it's not, something that is not capital is usually like cash in hand, so uh, uh, this is not considered capital, okay? What's in my wallet, usually by economists, they, they would say that a tractor is capital, okay? So physical capital. Now, they name this P as the total factor productivity, and it'll be proportional to the quality of technology, um, greater than or equal to zero, typically, of course, greater than zero. Then we're going to have some other parameters. Okay, I'm going to need 
Um, one of them is the national savings rate, S, okay. Uh, G will be population growth rate. And D will be capital depreciation rate. So if your times, if, if, if capital depreciation rate, it might be your, your tractor loses 5% of its value or 10% of its value every year. Why? Because, for a number of reasons it can, because it, it's wearing out, right? Technology wears out like that, uh, therefore it has less value. And how do I know that? Well, if I have a, a, a car in the United States, I drive it off a lot, I, I lose money a year later, <laughs> more money. So I, I can't convert my capital. Every time I try to convert it back to real cash, I can get less and less, okay, from that. Um, so that, that is, that there is a capital depreciation rate. Um, of course, that capital depreciation rate can depend on what your capital is physically. And it can also, of course, depend on your ability to convert it into fluid cash. In particular, it may change based on location or country. Okay, so there's, that's the, the basic setup and some of the parameters we'll be using. Um, we are not here talking about yet individuals. We're talking about countries with millions of people in them, okay? Next, let's talk about economic growth. So this is an ordinary differential equation. If you haven't had differential equations, don't worry about it. All you need to do to understand this equation is understand the left-hand side. That the left-hand side is a derivative, okay, which you have in calculus, either in high school or at Ohio State. So that derivative, it's even easier to understand. Everybody knows that that derivative is just a slope. So you don't need to get fancy with limits, et cetera, on the derivative. Just It's a slope, right? If that left-hand side, ignore the right-hand side a second, but if that left-hand side derivative is positive, then it says that capital is what? Going up. If it's negative, it's going down. And if it's equal to zero, it's staying the same. So what you would say is the country is getting richer, poorer, or stagnant at the same level, okay? Uh, now, there's two terms on the right-hand side that affect whether capital's increasing or decreasing or staying the same. In particular, you have SPF of C, okay? Well, the savings rate's just another constant Okay. And then you have P, uh, the proportional quality technology. Then we have the production function. So I've explained that first term already. That's the way to think about it. It's how much money I make for a given amount of capital. Okay? That's all it is. Nice and easy. This term also is easy because, remember, G was just the, the essentially you think about as rate of making babies by the country. Um, D is depreciation. So with this term here, um, this term is positive, of course, okay, and then it says minus this positive term times C. Now, whenever you have an equation like this, the thing to do is always just pick it apart. Let's assume for a minute that um, P is zero, so this guy's gone. So what does this equation mean? What will happen if I start the equation out at, let's just say C is 100? Well, if C is 100, I multiply by a positive term, G plus D, right? I take it times a negative sign. So guess what? If that number is a negative number over there, which implies that the derivative on the left is negative, right? Obviously. Which means the capital is going down for the country. Okay? So it's, going, it's, it's coming down. That's all it means. Now, what's interesting is, is that if G plus D is bigger, guess what? That slope is, is more and more negative, right? Why? Because if you're making babies at a high rate, you're taking its capital labor ratio, so you're dividing the C number by a bigger and bigger number. Therefore, the country's in a sense poorer and poorer, 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 right? If D, your depreciation rate, is higher and higher and higher, then your capital's going down faster too. So this is essentially working against your wealth. Okay, any questions? So that's the guy that's working against economic growth. You hope that this is working for you, and there's going to be a balance between these two sides that will be crucial in whether you get economic growth. Okay, I haven't defined F yet, though. But that guy, this term, 
is defined only to be positive. This, this term's only positive. This term's only negative. Because you'll see that C of T will always be positive. It has to be, we're talking about money. It can't be negative money. We're not talking about loans and things like that. We're not focusing on something like that. <coughs> okay, so keep in mind, the first term forces increases in wealth. This forces decreases in wealth. The way these two relate will say whether we'll end up going up or going down or staying the same. Yes? What's the depreciation of D? D sets how much, I buy the tractor, what is the tractor worth next year? So it's not. The, it's a constant. The variable D isn't going to be a negative. No. It's going to be a positive. Always be a positive. A negative kind of. Yeah, it's not like, well, I don't know of any car in the United States, for instance, you buy and drive it off, drive it off a lot, it's worth more after you drive it off a lot, because then you just sell it back to the dealer, right? right. It always goes down. So D, D is always positive, then times the negative will drive the value of the capital down. Okay? Isn't, isn't D also a function of time? We're going to assume here, it, generally it would be, we're going to assume here it's constant. Just like we're going to assume that G is constant. Well, we know that G, look, countries in the world that are making the fewest babies per person, okay, are the richest countries, right? So if your country is getting rich, that is C is going up, guess what? This number is going down, generally speaking, in the world. We're not, we're not talking about that case. That's harder to deal with, mathematically. Okay, anything else? Okay, now, what we're gonna do is, you always, these kind of things, you pick it apart by considering the easiest cases first. Stagnant growth is the easiest case to consider. In other words, what we're going to do is let this be zero and see what it implies in terms of everything, in terms of the going up and going down terms, the first and second terms, um, what it implies. In other words, I'm going to assume if I have stagnant growth, what does it mean about these two terms? Well, if it's zero, then of course this guy is zero, okay? So I'm setting them equal to each other. Of course, that means that I can pull this term over here and I've got SPFC equal to G plus DC, okay? Now, this uh, case actually is what you um, probably have studied in differential equations if you took that class is, uh, is an important case. When this guy is zero, <coughs> C values that guarantee it's zero are called equilibria. Okay? Now, that means that we'll have stagnant growth. Under, what we're going to do to make the analysis easy is we're going to assume that f of zero is zero. In other words, if I have no capital, no tractor, no hoe, no capital whatsoever, I can't make anything off of them, right? So it makes sense that f of zero is zero. So no problem there. But if f of zero is zero, you look at that equation and you, you, you say, how do I solve that equation? It's actually not easy to answer the question of how to solve that equation until I define what that f is, of course. Okay? Now, we need to talk, do a little side note here about equilibria. All right, and the best, most easy example to think about here is the so-called inverted pendulum or non-inverted pendulum. So you take a pendulum and you fix it at a point here and it can rotate, it's got a ball on the end. Consider not the uppercase now, consider the lowercase. If you take this and put it on a hinge and you perturb over to here and you drop it, what happens? It'll fall, right? Now, how it will fall will depend on th what you assume about the model. Under a normal, a normal person would say that a pendulum right there would swing, 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 go to zero, right? Right? Now, of course, there's mechanical engineers do funny things like assume zero resistance, and then if it, it goes, you start over here, it goes back and forth, and it stays in an infinite oscillation. Okay? But look, it's, you know it's going to go to zero. Furthermore, um, Here's what's interesting. Don't perturb it off of that point. Just take it and set it right at that point. Just perfectly hanging down. Say that's the initial condition. What happens then? Something really boring. What happens? Nothing. Nothing. Exactly. 
it stays right there. Guess what? That's when the derivative is zero because the derivative represents motion, being non-zero, represents motion. There's no motion. It stays right there. The derivative stays zero. It's an equilibrium. This is an equilibrium. Okay? So keep that concept in mind that it's, it's, if it starts there, it stays there. That's what an equilibrium is. Now, interestingly, let's consider the other case. Flip it up. Now, if you put it right on that vertical, what's going to happen? It's going to stay there. Okay? What does that mean? It means an equilibrium also. There's two equilibria in this system. There's one for down here and one for up there. It's two equilibria, okay? Because the dot of the angle variable is zero in both those cases. It's not gonna be for any other case, right? If you take it over here and you let it go, it's gonna fall, right? So those are the only two cases in this example where you will have equilibrium. There's two equilibria. Now, once you have a concept of an equilibrium down, we can talk about stable and unstable equilibria, okay? And when I, I'm, I'm using this term slightly loosely here, um, we're really talking about something that's called asymptotic stability, but nonetheless, um, in this case, if I put this guy at the equilibrium, and I go up to it and I perturb it, I dick and knock it over a little bit, what happens? It goes back, goes back to what? Stable equilibrium. No matter, when I perturb it just a little, little bit, arbitrarily small amount, it'll return to that equilibrium. Come down, settle out there. That's called a stable equilibrium. Now, contrast that with what happens up here. I put it at the equilibrium at the top. It sits there for all time until you walk up to it and flick it. Take it once. What happens then? Does it move back to the equilibrium? Nope. That is an unstable equilibrium. In fact, if you perturb it, it's not gonna, it's not gonna go back here. It's gonna end up down here, isn't it? Okay? So equilibria can move, between, you can move from one equilibrium to another. Um, stable equilibrium, unstable equilibrium. We need, these are, these are uh, general concepts, very general concepts. You can think about I mean, fortunately, I'm maintaining an equilibrium right now. I'm standing here, and my toes and feet are making sure I don't fall over, right? So that's the inverted pendulum case, okay, when it's inverted. But there's all kinds of equilibria in life. If you get onto this concept, you'll come to realize that um, there's much in life that is about being in an equilibrium or flip, moving away from equilibrium, going back to it, or switching to another equilibrium. This is all over dynamical systems. I mean, if I take my sweater off, you know, my sweater's maintaining a little too warm of an equilibrium for my body, so I take it off, I'll settle out to another temperature equilibrium. I mean, it's unbelievable how present this idea is in what we do in life. Okay? Questions? Yes. Will this be considered a linear system or a nonlinear? That is a nonlinear, nonlinear system. But since, like, uh, a nonlinear system can also have, like, unstable equilibrium and equilibrium states, definitely? Right there. Okay. Yep. The system we are dealing with right now, our, our system of interest, that is, this, this system is what? Linear or nonlinear? I haven't told you what F is, so you don't yeah. know. But, but, it, but it, looks, 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 it looks like it's a nonlinear system. It is a nonlinear system. We're going to have to deal with the fact this is a nonlinear system. So that, that's what makes it a, a little more interesting. Okay. So equilibria are found. When I take the derivative and set it to zero. And then you can ask the question whether it's stable or unstable, et cetera. Okay? Let's do, it. Let's do an example of finding an equilibrium. Um, for the system we are working with before, we had that would mean that we'd take dc dt, the slope, and let it equal zero, we'd have stagnant growth. So what that meant, just copying from above, I'd have this system equal to zero. Okay? So um, look, what you can do here is um, we got this case, and uh, what I like to do is, is pick f. I gotta pick a function f, where f is zero is zero. So I'm gonna pick the simplest possible one, and th that would be um, this one right here, p, c of t, as I mentioned above. 
Now I'm going to do a little bit of algebra here. So I'm going to take this guy right here, okay, and I'm going to put him up there. So what I've got is SPC, SPC right here on the left, okay, under item one. Uh, next, I've got minus G plus DC, minus G plus DC equals zero. Well, there's an algebraic equation. We can solve that easy enough. We've got SP minus G plus D, minus G minus D, times C equals zero. S, P, G, D, they're all positive numbers, okay? Doesn't even matter what they are because the only way to get this guy to get go to zero is what? C is zero, okay? So, C is zero, C equals zero is an equilibrium. So it says, if C of zero is zero, C of T will stay zero for all T greater than or equal to zero. Pendulum starts at the bottom, it stays put. If capital, if uh, if the capital rate, um, if, if I let C of zero equal to zero, then DC DT will be equal to zero, and I'll be at stagnant growth. So what is this? Is a very special case. You got a country that has no capital whatsoever. That says they're stuck right there at no capital for all time. Absolute terrible poverty means you're in absolute terrible poverty for all time, in a sense. Okay? So that, that's the first trivial case. We're going to look at much more interesting cases as we go through this. Okay, everybody with me? Okay? So, <coughs> we have an equilibrium at C equal to zero. You'll be doing uh, equilibrium in your homework that'll be more interesting than that one. We'll do some more interesting ones here in a moment. Um, other production functions. So the common view of economic growth says this. It says that F looks like a function like that. Now, look at that function for a minute, you, you know, and can somebody quickly look at it and tell me its shape? F of C, if I plot C along the horizontal axis, F along the vertical axis, what's the shape of the function? The way you do this, is you first ask what happens when C is zero. If this is zero, one over one, one minus one over one is zero. So F of zero is zero. Okay. Now, the other, at the other extreme, if C goes to infinity, what happens to F? Well, if C goes to infinity, you've got one over infinity. Okay. This guy goes to zero, this guy's one, so this thing will be one. So somehow, this thing starts at zero and kind of goes up like that, right? That's what that function does. Okay. Um, what's interesting is if you just take, take the derivative of this guy, <laughs> df dc. Okay, it's, you can do the derivative, that's freshman calculus or high school calculus. It's just this function, okay? So you, so you look at that and you say, okay, well, what is the slope of that? I drew that function like this, right? Just kind of moving smoothly up. But what is the slope? Well, the slope at zero is just A, this number. So it's going up like this, right? But if C goes to infinity, what happens here? This goes to infinity, this goes to infinity, A over infinity is zero, so slope goes to zero. So indeed, when I did it with my hand like this, coming up, it levels off. The slope becomes zero, okay? Um, now, here's the thing, why I put the little smiley face there. This is beautiful for, if this represents the economic growth of the country, this is absolutely wonderful. Why? Because it means that no matter how small my amount of capital is, you will get richer and richer and richer as a country. No matter what. This is the conventional view of economic growth. In other words, you, you give the whole country one penny, uh, and they're going to get rich. Okay? That's what this model says. If you choose F that way. Okay? Or in the United States, you know, there's a common, very common view that if you have a little bit of money, you can make a whole lot of money. That's, a, that's ingrained in our culture. Okay? We're supposedly the land of opportunity. Okay. That's the, uh, this is like the notion of the rich get richer. 
this is the notion really that everybody gets richer, the poor get richer too. Okay? So, uh, what I want to do now is, is do a second example about um, equilibria. Only now I want to use that new f function. And you can deal with it quite easy because it's just algebraic. So what I want to do is, is I want to call, I, I, I plugged in, I did a little bit of algebra. You can do it by hand if you'd like. I'm not going to do it now. And I find out that the equilibrium now, there's one that's equal to zero, just like before. But there's another one. Remember the pendulum? We had two equilibria. In this system, we have two equilibria too now. The sequel zero one and this one. And it's in terms of parameters. Now, if you look at these parameters, it's going to move the equilibrium. So let's try to take um, an easy case. Uh, let's say S is the saving rate of the country. You go into the country, you say everybody starts saving more, and everybody listens to you, and they, so they start saving more of their money, and so S goes up. Okay? What happens to this equilibrium? It goes up. Right? Obviously. Now, um, on the other hand, uh, the same thing will happen with P. In introduce a better technology to the country, this equilibrium will go up. Okay? The cases for G and D and A are a little more complicated because of the divisions and the minus, blah, blah, blah. We'll deal with that in a little bit. But the point is, this equilibrium will move based on the parameters. Okay? Um, now, <coughs> let's look at a case. It's easiest just to do some computing now. Um, so what I'm going to do is just less than S equal 0.1, P equal 30, A equal 2, G equal 1, D equal 0.1. And the first question is going to be is, I say, what do the two terms in the ODE look like, the ordinary difference equation? Well, what I mean is, is back here, I want to know the shape of this in the shape of this, okay? So I'm going to just plot them, plot both the terms. Okay, so here they are. Uh, in this plot, the blue is S, P, F of C. Oh, indeed. It's a function that moves up and levels off. It goes like this, right? That's the blue guy. Now, the red guy is the D plus G times C. I didn't plot the negative guy. I just plotted the positive. And I plot that line. It's going straight up like that. Now, you know, you, you probably remember from high school or, uh, that you can uh, find um, where the function on the right goes to zero by a plot like this. It's the intersection point, right? Because then blue minus red, when they're hitting the same point, will be equal to zero. So the intersection point is what? It's the equilibrium. That's the equilibrium. In fact, any two points with those, the red and the blue lines intersect will be in equilibrium. So that, indeed, at zero, there's an equilibrium point. At this value right here, CE, there's an equilibrium point. Everybody with me? Those are equal, the cross points are equilibrium points. Okay? That, that's going to be a crucial point for us to understand going forward. Now, um, here's the thing. With, with, why you want to plot it this way, there's, a, there's more than one reason. You plot it this way, you can just find the zeros of the function at the top and get the equilibrium points. It's easy. You just look at where they hit. But there's a second reason. A second reason says the following. If the blue is above the red, well, if the blue is above the red, the blue is F, that means that that function on the right-hand side is what? Positive. positive, exactly. It's positive. That means the country's doing what? That means that the CDT is positive. That means the country's getting richer. Okay? On the other hand, if you have a situation where blue is below red, well, that's, that's not a good situation because what that means is your growth rate in your country and your depreciation rate are so high that um, you are going to be decreasing your capital. Okay? Everybody with me now? What I want you to do is when you look at the, I'm going to be doing these plots a fair amount. When you look at these plots, what, you're, what you want to do is be comparing which is on top and which is on the bottom and how that affects 
DCDT. Okay, so on um, first question, I start out. This is capital on the on the horizontal axis. The vertical axis depends on whether you're looking at the first term in the function or the second term in the function. Okay? I'm going to take the difference of the two, and if that is positive, then dc dt would be positive, for instance. So let's do a few exercises. Let's take c of zero, the initial condition, that is how much money uh, a country has in this year, and you want to predict what's going to happen next year. Okay? So let's put them at one in c. This is c along here. Put them at one in c. Where will they be at c next year? Will they be above one or below one? Above. Why? Yeah, because the blue guy, positive guy is above the red guy. Therefore, it's going to go up. If I was down here, way down here, same thing will happen, right? I'm going to go up. Okay, so for anything to the left of the dashed line, C will go up. But, let's put it at 3, C of 0. It starts out, C of 0 at 3. What happens? What happens? Yeah, it goes left. In other words, poor, the country gets poorer. Okay? Why? Because its, it's growth rate's too high, depreciation rate's too high. To offset how much money is being made, as represented by the production function. So, question. These are equilibrium points, just like the inverted pendulum. Up, down. Think of the idea. Is this, if I start at zero, I stay at zero, right? But, let's say I perturb off in wealth by one penny for the whole country. What happens? It goes up. It goes up. They get richer, richer, richer. Shoots right, right up here. Now, let's start here. So, guess what? Is that a stable or unstable equilibrium? Unstable. Unstable. Let's go over here and go, go to this, this, this line. Let's start right on that line. Okay, it's an equilibrium point. Now, let's perturb to the left. What happens? It goes, it goes to the right. Yeah. If I perturb to the right, it goes, right. it goes to the left. Guess what? It's a stable equilibrium. So guess what? The pendulum, in terms of the pendulum, this point is like this case. This point, I'm sorry, this point is like this case. And this point is like this case. Stable and unstable equilibrium. Okay? All right. Next. Um, the problem is, is things just don't work that way in life. You can't hand, hand a country a penny and expect them to get rich as a group. Okay? So I'm basing this work on a set of economist papers, including Jeff Sachs. Uh, we studied, uh, I think it was 18 African countries um, and uh, modeled with these types of equations what ha is happening in those countries. And they came out and said, well, guess what? There's something called a poverty trap. We talked about a poverty trap. A po remember, a poverty trap is the idea that if you're so poor, you can't get yourself out of being poor. So your poverty just creates more poverty. You're stuck. Okay? So let's see how they represent that mathematically. Um, you have to do something very simple. There's a little quadratic term. Remember this? We had this about the, we had AC plus 1. Now we're just going to have AC squared plus 1. This is going to have a, a dramatic effect on the situation, okay? First off, just take the derivative of this guy, df dc, okay? And what you find is, is that if you take f of 0, well, if you put 0 here, well, it's 1 minus 1 is 0, like you expect. Um, but the problem is, is that if you put c equals 0 in this equation, you get 0, this is a 1, this is a zero. The slope at zero is zero. We'll see that in just a minute with a plot. Um, but that's going to have a crucial implication for us. Okay, so it gets a little hairier in terms of math. You've got to go to a quadratic formula. I mean, big deal. Uh, but when you, once you get this squared here, the, the, you get a squared with the parameters. So they have to solve this quadratic equation. Um, if you just do a little bit of algebra, um, this is what you find. 
it's a little harder to see the relationships between you know, all, all the variables, so I'll just be plotting. But what is this quadratic equation? It's a quadratic equation in C, right? You know that in a quadratic equation, there's how many solutions? Two, Two right? Now, what's interesting here is, is that we know that one equilibrium is, is at zero already. But, um, you know, we can uh, uh, get two more from this equation. So I get three equilibria. So now we're departing from the pendulum concept a little bit. We got three equilibria as a possibility and we're gonna be plotting those. I get one from just simple observation that C equals zero implies that DC DT equals zero. The second and third one come from solving this equation, okay? So what I'm gonna do is keep it really simple. I'm gonna put in the numbers for G, D, A, S, and P lots of parameters, and then I'm going to have a quadratic equation and I can solve it, okay, and then we'll get those equilibria. I'll just do it computationally. So there's my numbers, and then I'm going to consider different values of P. So the first plot here shows um, C along here on the horizontal axis, um, and then I've got my favorite blue and red lines, okay. The red line is the same as before. I haven't changed it. But the blue line is different. Do you notice that it, it starts with a slope of zero, then comes <coughs> up and goes like this? Okay. Now, the blue pot is a different shape than before, right? Before it just went up. Now it's going, it's staying down, and then it's going up. That makes a very big difference. Okay. Because guess what? If I take the red line and plot it through there for some red lines, you're going to see. The intersection, all the concepts come right through from the earlier case. The intersection points are all equilibria. So there's an equilibrium at zero. There's an equilibrium at this cross point and at this cross point. Okay? Now, I, I name those different things, but really the important idea here is the following. Now look what happens. There's a very important difference down here with the poor, where the poor people are. So if you're a poor person, you start out, or poor person, poor country, you start out at C equal 0.5, what happens? Does, do you get richer or do you get poorer? Poorer. That's not what we had before. So this says that if you have very small amounts of capital, you don't get richer, <coughs> you get poorer. Because you got capital depreciation, you're making a lot of babies, etc. okay? Now, Interestingly, when you're over this threshold, though, guess what? If I'm sitting here at one, let's say, do I, if I start out there as a country, do I go to the right or left? Go to the right. If I start over here, where do I go? To the left. So guess what? What do we have? Is this a stable or unstable equilibrium? It's unstable. Because if I perturb that way, boom, I go to zero. If I perturb this way, I go up to here. Is this a stable or unstable equilibrium? Stable, because if I go down, I come up. If I go up, I go down. Okay? So by getting you to think about going up and down based on where you're at, you're doing a simulation of a differential equation in your head. You realize that, right? That's what you're doing. It's not that hard. Okay? Now, what I did furthermore is I took um, the blue function, and I just changed uh, P from 30 up to 40. So that represents higher quality technology being used by the people in the country. Well, they're making more money then, so obviously things are going to get better. And if you do this, look at the shift. Look at the blue line. If I take the blue line and I shift it up like that, what have I done? I've made the situation better. Because now, if a, person, if a country is living up in this region, that corresponds to be in this region, and they go up. So technology helps people get rich. Okay, that's well known historically. And not only do they go up, they end up at a better point because this point is to the right of that point. Not only do they get rich using smaller amounts of capital, but they achieve higher wealth, higher ultimate wealth. So you can see how important um, technologies are. Okay. 
Now that that a lot said just by that plot, but let me let me uh, not expect us to do the simulations in our head. Um, here they are with MATLAB. So you, it's just different. This is what we've already done these in words, okay? So let's go to the left side. This is the low technology side of P equal 30. Um, this is CT and CE, okay? And if I start below CT, I get poorer. I start above it, I get richer. If I start too rich, I get poorer. Now, why did I pick CE and CT as, as the notation? CE is in equilibrium. I just, it's, I, I could have used U for ultimate wealth, perhaps. But CT is a threshold. So what um, the development economist calls a poverty trap is defined by being in this region. Technically, that's what they mean. Capital is low enough so that if I start with an initial capital, I'll get poorer. Or at least I won't get richer. Okay? So this is called the poverty trap. When, a, when an economist says poverty trap, this is what they mean. Okay? Now let's look at what happens to the size of the poverty trap under higher technology. It shrinks, right? This band here becomes this band. So if you start out down here, you go down, but if you started if you started here, go over here, it'll go up. So the poverty trap actually shrinks with better technology, which is really cool. Okay? That calls for what? Engineering. That's what we do. We make technology. Okay. Um, if you don't like that view of a poverty trap, um, I heard you know you hear economists talking about when they look at this diagram, they'll say. This is the poverty trap right here. But that's the same thing, right? It's the same thing. Um, or this is the poverty trap. You talk about shrinking the poverty trap or growing a poverty trap, etc. What I'm going to come to this more later on, but what Jeffrey Sachs would say is, is look, we go in, it would hit a lot of his book was about the end of poverty was if we give these people $70, remember that was his number, each, what are we going to do? We're going to make them jump from being down here to being up here. First run a ladder, climb up on their own. That was his basic point. Okay? So in words, you read his book and you kind of doubt that. Would that really happen? In terms of his, his analysis with other, many other people, uh, you know, it's, it makes sense. Because what you're doing is you're getting on the other side of this equilibrium. Right? This unstable equilibrium. You're getting on the other side so you can climb on your own on up. Now, what I like to call this plot is, is something you know my, my dad used to say is the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. That's what this is about. Where you define this is the boundary between rich and poor. The poor over here, if you're on the left side of this boundary, you're poor and you're getting poorer. If you're on this side, you're rich and the rich are getting richer. That's a very old saying. Okay? So there's some... Uh, Sort of old wisdom associated with the mathematics here. Questions? Okay. Um, now, you can do something called sensitivity analysis. This is very common in engineering. Uh, you may not have heard it called this, but all right, electrical engineers, what sensitivity analysis often means is in a circuit, you grab a hold of a resistor and it's 22K and you want to change it to some value around there. You want to see the effect on the filter bandwidth or some other performance characteristics. So you do an analysis, you perturb one and see its per perturbation on another. That's what I'm talking about. It we do this all over engineering. Okay? So this is when you have some output, however you want to define it, take partial with respect to some input. Because it just roughly thinking of a derivative as the change in something per the change in something else, right? That's what a derivative is. So this, this function um, would quantify that. You can do this quite easily for this nonlinear system, the reason being that the, the equations aren't very complex, okay? So that, that's not at all hard to do. Um, indeed, if you don't want to do it analytically, just write out a bunch of algebra, what you can do is you can do it computationally. Now, computationally, the normal approach to do this is via what's called a central difference approximation. So you don't take, if you're gonna take a derivative, you don't do an Euler approach where you have a value here and a value here, take this value minus this value and divide it by the difference. You go to the center 
You perturb up, perturb down, and take the difference between those two points. That's numerically known to be more accurate. Okay, that's all. It's, it's very easy. The formula here says that you start at a point, you go up by this amount, you go down by this amount, form the difference, and h then is the total distance along the x-axis. This is the difference caused in the y-axis. That's the, the computational version of the derivative. This is very common to do something like this, especially for very complex systems. Okay. Um, if you think about it, back to the Monte Carlo analysis we had done already in this class, that's really what's showing on those plots. It's, but it's just for a more, comp a more complex case. Okay, um, let's do an example. Um, what I want to do here is I want to take, um, I just grabbed the plot from earlier. I got a, a P low plot for 30 at the top, P high plot for P equal 40 in the bottom. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I know that if I change um, S, P, S, and P, and G plus D, well then I'm going to move those equilibrium points, the C, T, and C, E. So let's do a few examples of what will happen. So let's suppose I, um, let's, let's start with P because it's the easiest because it's already up there. Take P and increase it. Well, that's the case from P equal 30 to 40. And the line comes down and hits lower. What have I done? I shifted CT this way. I shifted CE this way, right? So in, if you did a sensitivity analysis, the change in CT, partial CT, with respect to P, that's the derivative. Is it, um, question is, is it positive or negative, right? If I make a positive change in P, I get negative change in CT, right? Do you see that? Furthermore, if I make a positive change in P, I make a positive change in CE. That's a sensitivity analysis, okay? Um, now, so the P case is what we have up there. You can also think of that in terms of this. See, what's gonna happen, I like this in some ways for thinking, because what I can do is, is I can know that if I change P, I'm gonna move, I'm gonna, let's say I increase P, for instance, I'm gonna move this line up, and I'm gonna move this line down. And I can sort of replot those in my head, right? You know what's gonna happen. Similar comment here, that's what resulted over here in fact. Now, S appears right where P does. <coughs> it's P, S, F of C. So the same thing's gonna hold for S, no different. Now if you go to G plus D though, it gets more interesting because what you're doing then is changing the slope of the line, right? Changing the slope of the red line. If G plus D goes up, well then, you gotta be careful here. Does, does, a, does a line Go more this way or more this way? Up. Okay, so let's do an easy case. Let's take it and just move it up a little bit. So there's two equilibria still. Okay. Well, what happened to CT? Did it increase or decrease? Increase. Ouch. Poverty trap got bigger. Got more babies to feed. We got worse depreciation. Capital depreciation got worse. You can analyze the right one similarly. Now here's the thing. If that line, that line is set there to cross at two points, right? But if you, obviously if you raise G plus D too much, it doesn't even hit the blue line. What happens then? You only have one equilibrium, right? Now, in the case, let's be careful. If you just came up and dropped that red line right on the blue, then you'd have two equilibria, one at zero and one at the point where it dropped and hit. Okay? But if you pull it a little more up, you've only got one equilibrium, and what will always happen? Always go to zero. Exactly. No matter where it starts, it'll always go to zero. Okay? Now, is it what will happen if we consider the other extreme case? And that is when you take um, G plus D to zero. Now that line, as g plus d goes to zero, goes where? 
flat, right down on the axis. Now, at any point where g plus d is a little bit positive, you know, the question becomes, will it hit the blue line in the limit? This is like calculus, right? Will it hit the blue line in the limit? Yes, it always will. You can just think about it a minute. It's, it'll always make it up there. But once it hits zero, all bets are off, right? But if that hits zero, then what happens? You get the country achieves an upper limit on how much money it can make. It's not going to infinity. It's limited by that blue line going to a constant value. But, or is it? Does the, does the country get infinitely wealthy? Maybe this, this case doesn't even matter because it's impossible. But it's just interesting. Yes, Alex? I mean, depreciation will always be positive. So the only way to do that is to have the growth of the population be negative, at which point in the limit there's no people and you still have capital. Right. You run into all these kind of problems, right? Let's exactly. assume it's a constant. If G and D are constant and G and D are zero, what happens? There's no depreciation, there's, there's, there's no growth. No growth means the number of people stay constant in the country. So what happens? Keep using the same technology over and over again. But what happens to C? Yes. Oh, I was asking, is G like the between birth rate and death rate? That's... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's the growth rate. Increase. C would increase growth. Forever, exactly. They, it will go to infinity in that case. It's, it's completely unrealistic, though. Okay? You're at that point, it, by considering that case, you're breaking the model. It's, it's not going to happen. You're also breaking the model when you say that um, these, that red line's above the blue. Because you know what? You can't take C and let it go to zero, right? I mean, it can't go to zero. There's no way. The whole country dies. Essentially, right? So, in fact, I didn't point this out earlier. I waited till now. But what you're going to do in a homework problem is you're going to reconsider this example and you're going to have uh, the blue line move up a little at zero, corresponding to it going down to a dollar a day. Okay? Because the poor get poorer up to a point. They're all struggling to survive too. They're going to make it some way, maybe, or some will die of hunger, we know. But not everybody's going to die of hunger. Okay, so there's always going to be a non-zero value for the blue line at C equals zero. That's the case you'll consider in homework. What if both of them move in the same, same way, like uh, the red and blue have the same trajectory? In that Maybe it's trajectory. I mean, I mean it's, it's, it's of course the same shape, exactly the same. Uh, in that case, there will be like infinite equilibrium positions. Yeah. Yes, it would. Um, we're not considering that case. Okay, so a summary. Um, so rich get richer and poor get poorer idea. Um, there's a number of effects on the poverty trap like technology, savings, growth rate, and depreciation analysis. We're going to be going into in quite a bit more detail um, next class on the effect of technology diffusion. So you go to a country, you introduce technology, one person adopts it, more and more adopt it, more and more adopt it, and then how that affects um, economic growth also. Okay, we'll consider that next time. Um, and sensitivity analysis shows what happens as poverty trip characteristics, as parameter change. This sensitivity analysis could be highly valuable because what it tells you is how to inject money into the system. In other words, you, let's just consider two things. Is it more profitable to uh, um, improve technology, that is change P on how does it impact the country, um, versus um, reduce, putting in a program that would help reduce population growth, that is G. So can you, do you see how useful this could be? If you've got a good model, what you can do is you can do a sensitivity analysis on the parameters. It says, it says, 
how you're going to um, change the ultimate wealth or shrink the poverty trap based on introducing a technology or um, reducing growth rate. Of course, a technology could be used for reducing growth rate, okay? But other times, those are separate matters. Education is sometimes used for reducing growth rate or jobs programs for women and girls are, are education, educational programs, that's a good one. Educational programs for girls have an ultimate impact reducing fertility rates, that's well known. So should you invest in girls' education or technology for something else? Do you see how valuable the good model can be? Because those are very hard decisions because you know in our current analysis how closely coupled income, education, and health are. <coughs> Sensitivity analysis allows you to de sort of decouple and figure out in that tangled mess what is best to do, okay, in terms of, uh, of aid. All right, as long as you can get a good model. If your model's no good, your conclusions will be no good, right? So it's crucial to have a good model here. It's just like you're doing circuit design, you've got a model for the circuit, but your model is not very good. Of course, you're not going to be able to analyze and make decisions about how to do design of a circuit without a good model of a circuit. Mechanism, same thing. Airplane, same thing. If you have a good model of an airplane, you can design a better airplane without even flying an airplane. Okay? Civil engineering, same thing, right? The same idea holds. You need a good model. It's, it's really quite crucial. Okay, think. Any questions? Okay. We'll see you on Wednesday.